Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Robin Miller, and I'm lead pastor here at Church of the Shepherd. And again, so excited that you're here. For those who are watching online, we, uh, we welcome you as well. And just wanted to start out this morning's conversation just reading a piece of scripture. Um, it, it's a piece of scripture that comes out of the Gospel of Matthew in a particular section where Jesus was preaching. It was some of his greatest preaching. We've kind of come to call that the Sermon on the Mount. And in one particular piece, Jesus taught about prayer. Um, and in fact, we've already kind of recited some of these words. This is where Jesus offered the prayer to the disciples and what it is they should say when they pray. So I want to invite you to turn with me if you have your Bibles with you. If not, we have pew Bibles in the seat backs in front of you to Matthew um, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. And this is Jesus speaking. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, may your holy name be honored. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us today the food that we need. Forgive us the wrongs we have done as we forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. Do not bring us to hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Indeed. So we are knee deep in our message series uh, on prayer where we're asking the question, is anybody listening? Uh, specifically when we pray, you know, and I, I think this is a very important question. And this is a journey that we're taking together. Um, and if you were with us last week, you might remember that I talked about how we're going to be addressing some of the questions that many of us have on our spiritual journeys, <clears throat> myself included. I've had questions about prayer. I, I still do. Um, now, last week we talked about prayer that is based on relationship instead of something that we know we have to do or we should do. You know, the difference between prayer being a privilege versus prayer being a duty. And how when we experience prayer, when we move towards prayer as a privilege, as seen as a relationship, how that one shift in our thinking can be the most freedom-enhancing way of connecting to God whose vantage point we cannot achieve or even imagine. Um, and, and we talked about how, you know, the main reason that we pray is to know God, right? That, that's why we do it. We do it to know God. We're, we're, uh, we're not praying to make life easier per se. I mean, that's not the purpose of prayer. And prayer is not about, you know, obtaining some kind of magical mojo. We pray so that we can know who God is and, and to enhance that relationship. But prayer is, is challenging. And, and it even is for pastors. I, I, I'll tell you that honestly. I mean, there are times when I'm not sure exactly what to pray or when to pray. Um, you know, should I pray for a good parking spot at Walmart? You know, is that really appropriate? And I, fi I do it every time. <laughs> I would drive down I'm like, Lord, please let me get somewhere close. Um, you know, should we pray for God to let us ace the test, even though we know we hadn't studied for it? You know, should we do that? You know, should I pray for my house to be sold or for my dog to be found? I mean, does God care about and even get involved in that level of detail in our lives? And, and folks, that alone is such a huge topic. It's really a series on its own, just that one piece, that particular twist. And, and while I have those questions, I actually find myself struggling with prayer in other ways too. For example, you know, I, I know that God knows that I love my kids. Um, and I know God knows that because I talk about that every day in my prayers. I always ask God for protection over my kids. I ask God to take care of my husband, uh, to make my family safe. And, and I've told this to God for many, many years in a row now. So um, God knows that. And the th God knew it. 
even before I ever said it, right? So, so if God knows what's already in my heart, if God knows today I'm going to ask again for protection over my family and such, do I need to continue asking God for that? Daily, do I need to make my prayers about protection and happiness? That's a question that I oftentimes wonder. Um, in Philip Yancey's book on prayer, which the series is partly based off of, uh, a reader wrote in to him and asked him the point of prayer for something to happen in, in life. And she said, you know, she goes, I can understand prayer uh, being about in a way to have communion with God. I, I get that relationship piece of it. But she asked, you know, why should we pray for someone to be healed or for, you know, my husband to get a job or for my family member to come to salvation? She wanted to know, you know, why do we pray for those things? Should we pray for those things? And, and she went on to say that she oftentimes prays for others because many times she feels helpless to do anything else. And so she offers that prayer with the hope that maybe this time her prayer will make a difference in that person's life or in her life. And, you know, I, I wonder, I mean, have any of you ever had similar questions or, or struggles uh, around that piece of prayer? And if you have, I want you to hear me clearly. Those questions and struggles do not point to a lack of faith on your part. I mean, the honest part here is that, you know, questions and struggles are just simply a part of, of the journey that we call faith. That's why we call it faith. I mean, sometimes we're going to have those questions and those uh, a little bit of confusion around that. So that's normal. This is a safe place to explore those things. And so... What I do in those times is I, I take those questions and I take those struggles and I look for insights from the first century rabbi who came to this place, this world, this earth 2,000 years ago, and he just changed everything. I mean, surely Jesus, he had to have known about the power of prayer and, and also uh, some of the limitations of prayer. I mean, so what relevance might Jesus actually have for those of us that struggle at times with this privilege that we call prayer? So first, what I want to do is just kind of take a look at when Jesus prayed. You know, when was it he uh, placed himself in that stream of prayer? And the Gospels actually record just over a dozen specific prayers um, by Jesus. And not only that, there are also some parables and some teaching on the subject of prayer. Um, now, of course, Jesus would have followed the normal Jewish practice of praying by going to the synagogue at least three times a day. That's what you did if you were Jewish. Um, so he would have done that. And that would have taken care of that corporate prayer, right? Corporate prayer, praying together. That was an important piece of, of uh, his upbringing. It is for us as well. But Jesus also prayed alone. We see examples of that in scripture. Um, in, in fact, you know, when the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, how do we pray? And he offered the words of the Lord prayer. Jesus said, when you pray, you go off, go off by yourself to be alone with God. And then you say these words, you pray this prayer. So we know that Jesus prayed alone at times. And when he was alone praying, many times he would turn to prayer like us, um, when he was experiencing trouble in his life. That's a very natural time for us to, to pray. Um, I mean, no doubt he would have prayed as he fasted in the, in, in, when he was being tempted in the wilderness. Um, he prayed as his arrest and death approached. He, he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, we're actually going to look at that scripture next week. If you remember in that piece, he's, he's praying to God, you know, take this cup from me if it be your will, but your will not mine be done. I mean, that was a prayer that he was offering, certainly in a time of trouble. Um, as Jesus hung on the cross, he made seven statements in total. And three of those seven statements were actually prayers that he offered during that time. So whenever trouble faced him, that was when Jesus would go to prayer. 
But it wasn't only then, Jesus also relied on prayer kind of as a, a form of spiritual recharging. You know, when, when he was maybe feeling a little dry or a little burned out, that was a cue for him that he needed to pray. And there are stories that we read in the Gospels about, you know, after a long day of preaching to the crowds or dealing with the disciples or healing the sick, he would go off into this isolated place and he would pray. You know, there, there was more than once he told the disciples, all right, guys, you need to stay right here. And I'm going to go way over here across this big lake off on my own and spend some quality time with God. He needed that alone time as a way to kind of recapture his focus, so to speak, to kind of renew his, his sense of, of mission. He needed that. And so that was a, a time when he would pray as well. But we also see that Jesus prayed... Um, when major events events started to come up in his life. That was when we saw the intensity of his prayer also rise. For example, at his baptism, you know, just before his baptism, he, he, would, he prayed. Um, in the, the, he had an all-night session of prayer the night before he chose the 12 disciples. Um, and he also prayed, especially as he prepared for his departure from earth. Um, for example, you know, he prayed uh, for his disciples before he ascended into heaven. There was a time when he prayed for his disciples that they may experience the, the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, he said, I want you to, you know, I hope you feel the counselor that's going to come to be with you, to offer you comfort and that will be with you forever. Um, there was also a time where we see in the Gospels where Jesus burst into this great p prayer after a large group of, of followers came home and they were telling Jesus about the, these amazing spiritual victories that they had experienced on their, uh, in their travels. Um, when so Jesus would oftentimes pray before a big event was about to take place. So when things were heating up, when he needed that recharging or just before a major life event, you, you seem to see Jesus go deeper in his prayer. And so for me, that starts to answer at least one of my deepest questions around faith. And that is, does prayer matter? And the answer is yes. I mean, in those times when doubt starts to creep in and I wonder if prayer is just a holy form of talking to myself. I remember that the son of God who had spoken worlds into being. The son of God who sustains all of creation. He felt this compelling need to pray. I mean, he prayed as if it made a difference. He, in fact, prayer was like a, a lifeline that he would cling to. It gave him both the, the guidance and the energy to not only know God's will, but to also move forward in it and through it. And, and Jesus worked at that day and night, not only three times a day at the synagogue, but he also prayed alone. This was not something he just did once in a while. He did it all the time. And even then, he sometimes would grow frustrated with his surroundings. I mean, we hear on more than one occasion, Jesus kind of just looking at the disciples and going, oh, ye of little faith. You know, that frustration would still come out, even though these were the ones he had picked. He'd prayed about it. Um, you know, it, we also know that Jesus also had to, uh, he had to fight temptation in the wilderness. So not even he was exempt from that uh, facing of temptation. And we also see when he was hanging on the cross, he probably experienced some doubt. Because one of the things he said were the words, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, skeptics kind of raise the question about the purpose and the usefulness of prayer. And they say, if God is the one who knows best and knows everything, then what's the point of it? 
And I have to admit, there have been times when I've wondered if I should just stop bothering God with all of my petty requests for myself and for other people. Should I just get on with, you know, let God get on with the matters of running the whole universe while I just kind of do my best to take care of business where I am? And to these questions, I can only offer you the example of Jesus. The one who knew best the wisdom of God always felt the need to just flood the heavens with prayers. And if Jesus prayed, we can too. Now, some of you, you may be here thinking, you know, okay, I, I, I get that. I, I get why it is we pray. Um, you know, we pray because God did or Jesus did. We pray to have that communion with God. I understand that. I, I even understand when Jesus prayed. Prayed when things started to heat up. He needed that spiritual recharging or before a big life event. I get all of that. But what I want to know is what would that look like for me in my life? I mean, how do I do this prayer? And, and so if you're here this morning and, and you're wondering that, uh, hear me say that, you know, prayer, it, it's not just solely an intellectual or theological process. I mean, for me, prayer is, is about relationship with God. And so if you're here this morning and if you're finding yourself at the very beginning of this prayer journey and you're not sure exactly how to do it. Or if you have been praying most of your life and you maybe want to think of a new way, then this is what I hope you will try. First, maybe include some portion of scripture in your prayer every day. Um, and, you know, if you're like, well, I'm not exactly sure where to start in here even, then I would say start with the Psalms. I mean, the Psalms, they were the backbone of monastic prayer. Um, that was, they, they're, they're songs, but they're also prayers of, of a sort. Um, and there's 150 Psalms in the book of Psalms. So that'll take you through about five months. <laughs> You've got a while before you'd have to think of anything else. But maybe start your day reading one of those Psalms. And if, if that's not what you'd want to do, maybe go to the Proverbs. The Proverbs is a book in the Bible and those are spiritual sayings. Maybe just let one of those simple verses be the beginning of your prayer. But, but I'm here to say that using scripture, using the word of God is a great way to connect to God. And then another part of your prayer um, is conversation with God, where you really speak your mind. You know, sometimes I think we're afraid to tell God exactly what it is we're feeling, but I think that's one of the most important pieces of prayer and how we do it. I mean, we should go into this conversation with God talking about the very thing that might be the most difficult to talk about with anyone else. I mean, maybe we should go into that prayer talking about the shame that we feel or the guilt that we fear, or have or the fear that we have. And, you know, maybe it just starts out as one sentence. Maybe it says, you know, today, God, I, I feel afraid. Maybe, God, I feel afraid of you. Or, or maybe, God, today I feel uh, ashamed. Or maybe, uh, God, I feel uh, uh, guilt burdened. I mean, whatever that is, we need to have that element of honesty and conversation with God in our prayers. And we need to know that not only God can handle that, but that God would welcome that from us. And then the third part of our prayer, it really needs to include silence. I mean, just sitting in God's presence without saying anything or having any expectations of God or yourself. And I've heard that at times called the kitchen table prayer. And it's just kind of that, uh, that image of spending time with God as we would a friend, maybe at the dinner table. And, you know, in that moment of silence that happens, that's not awkward. I mean, we need to have that with God. And, and, you know, I know that there may be some of us who 
Maybe we've grown up with this image of God that is fearful. God was expected to be feared more so than than, uh, uh, obeyed or loved even. Um, Or maybe you have this image of God and the difference between God and you is so vast, you can't even picture yourself in a conversation, let alone being silent and it not being awkward with God. If you have those feelings, maybe in that time of silence for you, you can begin by just finding something to do that doesn't occupy your mind, but that you enjoy doing. I mean, maybe it's some handiwork, doing something with your hands, building something. I know for me, I've talked about this on Mondays, my cleaning day. That is oftentimes my time with God, and much of it includes some silence. Um, Maybe it's doing a crossword puzzle. But whatever it is, just sit in God's presence. I mean, just sit and and begin to learn that God is indeed trustworthy and that God isn't that person that you have to be afraid of. That God is something altogether different. So scripture, conversation, and silence. I mean, that is where prayer can begin for you today. And, and, you know, however much time you decide you want to give prayer in the beginning, just cut it back before you even start. I mean, maybe start with five minutes and just add a little bit of each month if you want to. And I'm, I'm not trying to give you an excuse for not praying, but what, I just want you to be realistic. Because there is nothing that derails prayer faster than starting with some sort of noble idea of what it ought to be. And, and then you can't live up to it. It's not the amount of time, it's the quality of time. Does God care? Does prayer matter? It did to Jesus. And if he knew God better than anyone, then I want to follow that example. He prayed when times were hard. He prayed when he needed recharging. He prayed when big things were on the horizon. And because of that example, we know that we can do the same thing. I mean, prayer, it's about spending time alone with God in Scripture and having that conversation with God and then just spending some alone time in silence, just in that presence. I mean, actually, prayer is just a pretty ordinary, everyday kind of thing. You know, C.S. Lewis, um, he said that we are completely known to God. And he said that God knows us inside and out. And so if God knows all of that about us, then what difference can prayer make in our lives? And Lewis went on to say that being completely known by God, that is kind of our destiny, whether we like it or not. But even though this knowledge never varies, the quality of our being known can. And he said, you know, we can open up with all that we are to be known by God. We can choose to unveil ourselves before God. We can offer ourselves for full view. We can invite God into our lives and ourselves into God's. And he said, when we do that, that is when we put ourselves on a personal footing with God. And that relationship, it it heats up. And then the potential for an extraordinary interaction begins to stir to life. I mean, Jesus knew the wisdom of God better than anyone. And he chose to flood heaven with prayer. We can too. In fact, let's start that journey now. Let's go to God in prayer. Most gracious and holy God, the words of the psalmist tell us that you have searched me, Lord. You know me. 
You know, when I sit, you know, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You know, my going out and my lying down. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. That's what your word tells us. And so, God, since you have already searched me, since you already know that today some of us feel scared, unfit, unworthy, some of us feel elated, some of us feel grief, some of us feel joy. But God, we come to you in this moment and we offer you all that we are. We unveil ourselves to you. And we trust that not only will you meet us where we are, but you will love us as we are. And so in the silence of this moment, God, let your Holy Spirit move in us. Let it move. The sounds of life that let us know you are here, Lord. We give you thanks. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.